So this morning, we're going to be talking about Jesus' amazing prophecy. And I've been promising you that this banner over here is going to make a lot more sense after we spend some time together this morning. So hold on to your hats. I've got some information to share with you. And then this evening, there's going to be two other prophecies that we dig into from the book of Daniel that I think are going to absolutely blow your socks off. It's absolutely my favorite uh, presentation to give. Um, I love doing all of the presentations, but this evening is one of my favorites. But before we dive in, I do not want to try to share from God's word without asking for God's blessing. Will you please pray with me? Loving Father, I thank you that we can be gathered here. And as my brother Dave said, it is a beautiful day. It's not beautiful maybe by weather standards, but it's beautiful because there can always be sunshine in my heart in my relationship with Jesus. And so today, Father, we come in the name of Jesus asking for your guidance, for your wisdom, for your understanding. Lord, I recognize I have nothing of any value to share unless you speak through me. So, Father, please give me the words to speak. Give me clarity of mind. Anoint my lips with a coal from the altar. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness, please, Father. Cover me with the blood of Christ. And, Lord, I also pray for my brothers and sisters. It's easy for our minds to wonder, to get distracted. Something happens around us and we get off track. Lord, take away those distractions. Help us to be truly and intently focused on learning from you this morning. So this is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to take you back in history and tell you a story that many of you probably already know, probably have heard before. But on April 12th of 1912, over 112 years ago now, the world's largest ship at the time, yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? What's the name of this ship? The Titanic. And what was the claim to fame for the Titanic? The unsinkable ship. I mean, John, some people were even so arrogant. The constructors, the architects, the engineers, one of them is even quoted as saying, God himself could not sink this ship. Ouch is right. But it goes on its maiden voyage from Southampton, England, steaming across the Atlantic for New York City. And it was traveling west uh, at about 26 miles per hour with an approximate capacity uh, passenger load, crew and passengers of 2,200 people. Some of the world's wealthiest people wanted to get in on the action. And so they were going to be a part of this unsinkable ship's maiden journey. And so everything's going fairly well. They're making their way. Third day of the journey, and the Titanic is just going through these icy waters, dead speed ahead, just as fast as they could go. But around 9 a.m. that morning, the third day of the journey, the Titanic received a message. Hey, watch out. Icebergs in the water. Possible icebergs. So see, as ships would see this, the telegraph was now in use, and so they would try to send out a signal to other ships to warn them. It, it was very new communication. It was state-of-the-art at the time. But as that first warning came in, neither the man who received it or anybody else wrote down the first message. 142, the same day, third day of the Titanic's maiden voyage, another warning came in, a communication from a neighboring ship called the Baltic. This time, second message was written down and given to the captain. Uh, but as that message came in, it turned out to be one of seven messages. Seven messages. Imagine you're the cat captain. You're responsible for all 2,200 souls on board. Warnings are being given. What was the response? Nothing. Why? Because of the arrogance of men. I'm, I'm captaining an unsinkable ship. Why am I worried about an iceberg? Even if I do hit it. I can't tell you what was going through the captain's mind. But I can tell you, right along midnight... Everything seemed to be doing just great. Some children were sleeping. The band was playing. Others were drinking and dining, just having a grand old time. Not knowing anything was looming in their path because they didn't say to the passengers, hey, watch out, there might be icebergs. We've got some dangers. We need to slow down. No, as far as they could tell, nothing had changed. But 
The lookout in the crow's nest was scanning. And I've seen a couple of videos over the year. I was like, how did they not see what was happening? Well, it's believed, and the reports, the weather reports to support this, that the waters were so calm that as they were going across the horizon, they didn't see anything. And you know how sometimes the horizon will mirror on the water? Have you ever seen that effect on a hot road out in the desert? It's as if the road disappears over the hill because of that, that weird parallax effect from the, from the heat. Well, when heat is rising, that air that's rising kind of moves the same way that water does. So the water was so calm that the parallax really made the horizon almost disappear, it's believed, until they got right up on the iceberg. And of course, the lookout saw it, but they saw it too late. And if you've ever been on a large ship, you'll know that they do not turn on a dime, right? And it's even estimated that the rudder of the Titanic was not quite big as it should have been, so it turned a little slower than your modern ships would do. But the Titanic struck that iceberg right at midnight, ripping a gash, about a 300-foot gash, down the side of the Titanic. Now, when they built it, the reason they thought that it was unsinkable is because they built the hull of the ship in these compartments. And they had bulkheads, which is a fancy name on a ship for a what? It's a wall, right? So they had these bulkheads, but the bulkheads did not go all the way up. They only went so far, and the pumps could not keep up with the surge of water that was coming in. Had the bulkheads been sealed all the way to the top of the decks below, then it could have been compartmentalized and maybe limped into shore. But that's not what happened. It began to take on water. And eventually, the captain decided that it's time to abandon ship. Captain Smith finally gave the command to lower the lifeboats. 2,200 people, but it was found out as they put the lifeboats in the water, the lifeboats only had the capacity to hold about 1,100 people. Half. And even when the announcement was made, abandon ship, abandon ship, some people were still under the delusion this ship can't sink. What is wrong with these people? Why are you afraid? But of course, the nose of the ship kept going further and further under the water. And of course, of course because it wasn't well organized and many people waited to the last minute, it turns out that out of the 2,200 people, only 711 approximately survived the sinking of the Titanic. Tragedy. And this is a little screenshot. This is an actual picture of a newspaper just days after the event. And they thought J.J. Astor, one of the most richest men in the world at the time, he was the Jeff Bezos of the time, I guess, right? Richest man in the world. He ended up surviving. The, 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 if you read a little bit below where it says 15 to 1,800 dead, you'll see that Astor actually made it. But here's the point. There was no reason for the Titanic to have sunk in the first place. How many warnings did they receive? Seven different warnings. Friends, can you look back on a time in your life where you suffered tragedy because you didn't have the good sense to listen to what somebody else was trying to tell you? I can. Are there times that you've brought trouble in your own life because you didn't listen to good counsel? Absolutely. It happens to all of us. And, and the sad part is, those warnings have been coming for mankind. And not just seven warnings. God has given warning after warning after warning, urging humanity, make a decision to turn away from sin. Destruction is coming to this earth. And friends, that's why I've been calling you day after day, night after night. Choose to walk with Jesus. Choose to walk differently. Yeah, the world's going to think you're crazy. What? Why do you want to live for Jesus? Don't you know there's so much living to be done? So much fun to be had? Well, friends, I grew up on the other side of being with Jesus. I grew up without Jesus. I grew up on that fun side, so to speak. And I can tell you the so-called fun side is riddled with alcoholism, drug abuse, sexual immorality, broken families, crime. 
tell you a little story. I grew up here in North Carolina, but I was born in Manassas, Virginia. You say, well, why? If your family's all from North Carolina, why were you born in Virginia? Because my grandpa was a moonshiner. Beautiful heritage, isn't it? <laughs> and he had already been busted. He and my great uncle, they got busted one time and actually spent some time in prison for illegal production of alcohol spirits. And the feds were closing in on them again. Actually, this time it was the state officials. And so they fled to Virginia to escape justice. So I was born in Virginia because my family were criminals. How's that for a heritage? All right? How much brokenness does a world need to see to find out that brokenness is not what God wants for us? Brokenness does not bring happiness. And God over and over and over has tried to tell us time is running out. And here's what's interesting. There are others that are seeing it. How many of you have heard of the doomsday clock? You heard of the doomsday clock? The doomsday clock is this estimation by economists, and physicists and other scientists who they look at what's happening in the world and they say, listen, we cannot continue on the path that we're on. This is going to lead to a destruction. Now, they don't see it in a spiritual context, but they, they see something's happening. And, and many have questioned, how close are we to the end? Anybody ever heard of an astrophysicist by the name of Dr. Stephen Hawking? This, unfortunately, is what Dr. Hawking looked like towards the end of his life. Uh, of course, his body was crippled by a terrible disease. But notice what Dr. Hawking said. Now, he was an avowed atheist, and so obviously I would not agree with everything he says. But notice what he shares. He says it is important for the human race to spread out into space for the survival of the species. Why? Well, life on Earth is that the ever-increasing risk of being wiped out by natural disaster, nuclear war, a genetically engineered virus, can you say COVID, <laughs> or other dangers we have not yet thought of? Interesting. Do we see an increase in natural disasters? Did Jesus teach us in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, did he say as we get closer to the end of time that there will be an increase in these natural disasters? So how is it that an astrophysicist that doesn't even believe in God is seeing it, yet Christians don't take it seriously? Wow. Notice what Hawking goes on to say. We won't find anywhere as nice as Earth unless we go to another star system. Well, listen, I can't agree with everything Stephen Hawking ever said, but I think he's on to something here. What do you say? And not only is, has Hawking and other scientists and politicians scrambling, right, to find answers, trying to find what, what solution do we have? How do we prepare for this? How do we escape it? How do we, how do we get ready? What can we do to deal with this problem? And yet nothing seems to be working. Well, I'm happy to give you some good news this morning. Amen? I like to get good news. Bible prophecy gives us insight into where our world is headed in the future. We'll get to see how God addresses this stuff. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. You'll find this on your text guides. Hope that you're following along, that you're filling these out so you can look at them to study more for later. But God says through the prophet Isaiah, remember the former things of old, for I am who? I'm God, and how many others are there? There are no other, there is no other, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. This is God's promise that if you want to know what's going to happen in the future, talk to me. You want to know where your future lies? Read my word. You want to know what's going to happen to this world? Dig into the Bible. Study the prophecies that I've given you. Surrender to my teaching. He says, behold, in Isaiah 42, 9, the former things have come to pass and new things I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. I love that the Lord has said, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen so that you don't have to be worried, that you don't have to be afraid that you can basically have an intergalactic safety briefing where God tells us what's going to unfold. I would say to you that fulfilled Bible prophecy verifies the truthfulness of God's word and gives us confidence that the future is in his hands. How many of you can say amen to that? We can trust what God says, and I'm going to show you some things today, and we're going to go to the book of Daniel. 
And we're going to see this amazing prophecy that unfolds in the second chapter of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 1, it kind of goes over that journey of their captivity. You know, Daniel, and he had three friends. Do you remember their names? I don't want to hear their pagan names. I want to hear their Christian names. Do you remember their Christians' names? Hananiah, Mishael, come on, you can get one out of three, Azariah. Right? Yeah, they became Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but we call Daniel Daniel. We don't call him Belteshazzar, right? I'm just messing with you. But in Daniel chapter 1, we see that journey of he and his friends who chose to remain faithful. Daniel chapter 2, we now see that he has been established. At the end of chapter 1, he and his friends were found to be how many times wiser than the other trainees? Ten times wiser because they honored God. So now Daniel and his three friends are counted among the wise men of the courts of Babylon. So let's look at Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and he goes to sleep one night. How many of you have ever had a dream, and you wake up, but you can't remember the dream, but you knew it was something weird or strange? Yeah, we all have had those moments. Well, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And the dream was so fascinating, but when he woke up, he could not recall what it was. He just knew that it was something special, and he desperately wanted to know what it was. So he called all of his wise men. He called the Chaldeans, or some would say the Chaldeans. I think it might actually be Chaldeans, because I heard a guy from Iraq, uh, one of my professors at uh, Andrews University, Dr. Joe Kidder, he is from Iraq, and he said Chaldeans. Maybe it's Chaldeans, but the Chaldeans, the astrologers, the wise men, the magicians. Nebuchadnezzar calls them all together and he says, listen, I had a dream. I can't remember the dream. Tell me what I dreamed and then tell me what it means. How many of you would like that command? Notice what they said to him. Daniel chapter 2, verse 10. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, there's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. (laughs) Therefore, No king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. In other words, if you can't tell us the dream, how are we supposed to tell you what was in your head? Seems like a logical thing to say, right? Nebuchadnezzar still wasn't happy. Notice what happens. For this reason, the king was what? And very... And he gave the command to do what? Mercy. How happy are you that you're now among the brain trust of Babylon that morning? How many of you probably think they were wishing they had a different job? (laughs) So a decree goes out. If you can't tell me what I dreamed, tell me what it meant, I'm going to kill all of you. And if you go back and read the whole passage, you'll see that not only am I going to kill you, I'm going to burn your house down. I'm going to completely destroy who you are as a person if you can't do this impossible task. So the king's men start doing this. The decree went out, and they began killing the wise men. And guess who else they were looking for? Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They sought Daniel and his companions, and what was the mission for them as well? They weren't even there. They weren't even there, and they're getting killed as well. So... Then with counsel and wisdom, we're in Daniel 2, 14 to 16, Daniel answered Arioch. He was the captain of the king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. At this point, we don't know how many had been killed, just that they had begun doing so. And so here comes Arioch. He knew Daniel. Daniel knew him. Arioch had been with them through their training in Daniel chapter 1. So he answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, this is Daniel, Why is the decree from the king so urgent? I think if somebody's trying to kill me, I might ask, what's the hurry? I'm here to kill you. Well, what's your hurry? Let's talk about this. Seems reasonable, doesn't it? Stall tactic? Maybe. Notice, Ariok made the decision known to Daniel, so Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time. Friends, push the pause button for a second. What does this tell you about Daniel's relationship with the king? Do you think Daniel was fairly well respected? I mean, you're under a death decree, but instead of being dead, 
excuse me, what's the rush? The king very well could have said, kill him, get him out of my face. But there was something there. There was a relationship. Friends, I want you to remember this. Allow Jesus to help you build relationships in your life because you never know how those relationships might be used for the glory of God. Amen? Be respectful. I don't, I don't think you always have to agree with your government officials, but try to be respectful. If I get pulled over by the police, even if I'm not in the wrong, it's yes, sir, no, sir. I'm going to be respectful. Try to win that favor, right? That soft answer turns away wrath. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. It continues in Daniel 2.17. Obviously, he was given time to do so. Notice what Daniel's first response is. He went to his house, and he made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. Check this out. Daniel finds out he's under a death decree. He gets the permission from the king to have overnight to talk about this, to pray about this. The first thing Daniel does is has a prayer meeting. Another major lesson that I want you to take away. When you find yourself in trial in this life, the first place we should turn is to God. The first instrument we should use in our arsenal to fight the enemy is prayer. Daniel knew this. So... He's talked to his friends that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So Daniel goes to sleep. Got a question for you. If you were under a death decree the next day, how easily are you going to go to sleep? How many of you think you would have spent some time in the Bible? Maybe stayed up. I probably don't need to sleep. Maybe I should just spend the night in prayer. Nowadays, we'd be on Google, right, or something else, trying to figure out the answer to this thing. Daniel lays down. Why? Because he had the faith to believe that God was going to give him the answer to this problem that he could not solve. Daniel 2.17 says, Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision, so Daniel blessed the God of heaven. He didn't stay up whining and pining all night long. Why? Because Daniel chose to walk with Jesus. He chose to walk with God. He chose to be a disciple, even in the face of great danger. And when you choose to be a disciple, you can have peace in the journey. And if you don't choose to be a disciple, well, of course you're going to fret and worry. Why? Because you're trusting in you more than you are God. Friends, I want to call you over and over. Choose to walk with Jesus. Choose to embrace that peace in your heart that Daniel had. This is a promise from Jesus. Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Jesus understood. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will what? You'll find. Knock and what? It will be open to you for everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Now, this doesn't mean that, you know, I want to buy a new car. And so, Lord, I'm asking, give me a new car. You may need the car that you have. We're talking about in these spiritual things. If you seek God's guidance, he will guide you. And yes, you may have to pass through certain things for a season that develop your character and cause you to learn how to trust God more deeply, right? God doesn't always take the obstacle out of the way. He didn't put it there, but sometimes he'll use it to build our character and our faith through that. Daniel not only practiced this in Daniel chapter 2, how many of you remember the lion's den? Again, second time at least we find out in Daniel's life he's facing a death decree if he's faithful to God. Don't be praying. No, nope, Daniel said, I've got to be faithful. And he still prayed three times a day in Daniel chapter 6. And of course, he went into a den of hungry lions. And the angels came and they held their mouths shut. Wow, what a God we serve, amen? Of course, we could look also at the plain of Dura when they went in in Daniel chapter 3 and they were thrown in the fiery furnace. Not time for that today, but let's continue the story. Daniel 2.26, the next morning he comes into the king. King's sitting on the edge of his seat, I guarantee you. 
wanting to know, can he pull it off? Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel 2, 26. Next verse, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, magicians, soothsayers, cannot declare to the king. I love that he recognizes this is not a problem that will be solved with human reasoning. There are some problems, friends, that I don't care how smart you are, I don't care how much life experience you have, I don't care how much training you have, there are going to be some problems that cannot be solved with those tools at your disposal. They have to have a higher source. That's why Daniel said in verse 28 of two, verse chapter 2, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. How many of you could say amen this morning? Praise the Lord. And notice this. My prayer time, that extra time you gave me, was not unfruitful. He has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be tomorrow. I'm testing you to see if you're still awake. Which, which time period? Hang on to that. God is trying to tell us, he was trying to tell Nebuchadnezzar, what you saw doesn't just pertain to tomorrow. What I'm revealing to you in this vision. And, and, and why reveal it to a pagan king first? Could it be that God was trying to win the heart of Nebuchadnezzar? Could it be that God wanted to save a pagan king? Read the book of Daniel and you'll see that Nebuchadnezzar had a journey with God where eventually he gave his heart to God. Wow. So God was trying to win Nebuchadnezzar. And he said, this is also going to touch on what happens in the latter days. And you know, we've touched on this early on in our series about these life questions that people have. People want to know, how did I get here? Right? What is my purpose while I am here on this earth? How should I live my life? While I'm here, these are existential questions, we might say. Where am I going when I die? Well, praise God, we read the scriptures last night. And what happens to us when we die? To sleep, right? I love how the scripture said, from the dust ye came, and to the dust ye shall return. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says that God formed man out of the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And when we die, the reverse of that happens. Our breath goes back to God and our body's just resting, waiting on the shout. Oh, mercy. How many of you are waiting to hear the shout? Waiting on that last trumpet. How many of you want to hear that last trumpet? Oh, mercy. So we know that the answers to these are not found in the musings of men. These are not found in the ideas of mankind. These are answers that we can only find trusting our God. Nebuchadnezzar, he says to him in Daniel 2, 31, you, O king, were watching. And imagine Nebuchadnezzar. All of a sudden, Daniel starts describing the dream in great detail. How do you think Nebuchadnezzar was? Do you think he was nodding off or do you think he was glued in? I'm going to tell you what, man. He would have been like, this is really happening. <laughs> this guy's really going to tell me. Oh, I want to hear it. Tell me, tell me. Oh, and I imagine as Daniel began to tell him each piece, flashes of that dream started coming back to his mind. You were watching in this great image whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. He goes on to say in verses 32 and 33, this image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Question for you. Based on this image, Based on the description from the Bible, where is the most precious metal? So there's something being indicated. Hold on to this piece. There's something being indicated that whatever this image represents, the best is at the top and the more inferior is at the bottom. Can, can you relate to that with me? Okay, let's see what it actually means. Daniel tells him in verse 34, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image where? On its feet. And how are the feet made up? What are they mixed with? Iron and clay. Which is stronger, iron or clay? Iron, of course, right? So you know part of the feet are weak, part of it is strong, and broke them into pieces. 
Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floor. The chaff is the part that's separated from the outer berry, if you will, of the wheat. And that chaff was very lightweight, and so they would, they would thrash it, and then they would have others that are fanning, winnowing, and that wind would blow away the chaff, and all that was left was the usable wheat berries. Okay, That's what he's re- describing. The wind carried them away that no trace of them was found. All of those metals ground up, blown away, and the stone that struck the image became what, friends? Great mountain, and it filled how much of the earth? How do you think Nebuchadnezzar is feeling at this moment? Wow, what? Yes, that's exactly what I saw. Yes, yes, tell me more. And imagine the others that hadn't quite been killed off yet, this guy's really doing it. His God really told him this. Well, this is the dream, Daniel says to him in verse 36. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. Half of the order has been fulfilled, yes or no? What was the first part? Tell me my dream and then tell me the interpretation. So part one's been accomplished. God has come through strongly for Daniel, amen? Notice now. He says to him, you saw this image, and I imagine him walking him through this, that he just dumbfounded, not knowing what to say. Maybe he's wondering in his mind, just like maybe some of you are, what is this head of gold? What is this chest of silver? What, what does it mean? Then a belly and thighs of, of bronze. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar would have known these were descending inferiority. Iron legs? And then iron feet and clay? What does it all mean? But he's remembering in his mind and he begins to recall. And then seeing that stone. And when you hear in the Bible that a stone is cut out without hands or something is made without hands, it's a reference to God intervening in a mighty way. And it busted up all of those images, those materials, and grew into a great mountain that filled the entire earth. I imagine Nebuchadnezzar was completely blown away as he thought about and wondering, eager to know what was happening. Well, he continues, verse 37, you, O king, are a king of kings. Do you think Nebuchadnezzar agreed with him? Of course he did. Nebuchadnezzar, you're the man. That's essentially what he's saying to him. For the God of heaven, oh, wait a minute, where did his power come from? Who does Daniel credit Nebuchadnezzar having his power and kingdom? It came to you from God. Don't think you came up with it on your own. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over all of them. You are this head of gold. Wow. And I'm going to tell you, it went to Nebuchadnezzar's head. I remember growing up as a kid, I I love growing up in the South, so we just have all these sayings that are just so amazing. And I remember as a kid, somebody would be telling you that you did something well, but they didn't want you to get arrogant. They don't let it go to your head, right? And I remember one time I, I brought home my report card and I was showing my grandparents and I was, I was so happy. I had gotten some A's and good report on my behavior. And I remember my grandmother was just going on and on about it. My papa, just from the quietness of his chair across the room, he said, listen, don't keep building that boy up. You'll have to butter his ears to get him through a door. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar, it went to his head. You say, Pastor, how do you know? Because in chapter 3, he recreated the image that he saw in his dream, but the image didn't just have a head of gold. It was a 90-foot-tall statue that was made of pure gold. Now, I can't imagine that much gold, but that's what the Bible tells us, and it gives the measurement in cubits, comes out to about 90 feet on the plain of Dura. Go and read it for yourself. But he says, you are the head of gold. Then he says to him, but after you shall arise what? Another kingdom. Is it equal to Babylon? Says it's inferior. Is gold more valuable than silver in our modern economy? Yeah, and it must have been in Nebuchadnezzar's as well. This second kingdom will be inferior to yours. Then check it out. 
another, a third kingdom of bronze, which is more expensive, bronze, brass, or silver? Right? So we're seeing a descending value that's happening here. Gold the most precious, silver, brass, or bronze. And then we see these will rule over the earth. Now, let me pause for a second. I've had people ask me, well, what do you mean rule over the entire earth? They ruled over a region. In the Bible, when it's talking about ruling over the earth, it's talking about the then known world. Okay? And it also is talking about those kingdoms which had an impact on the people of God. So, so don't get hung up on the geography. Going, well, God didn't care about indigenous people that were... No, that's not what it means. It's talking about the then known world. So let's continue. This fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything like iron that crushes in that kingdom. So have you picked up on the fact that each of these metals represents a kingdom? How many of you are tracking with me? Who's the first kingdom? If Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold and he's the king of Babylon, the first kingdom has to be Babylon. Okay, so let's continue to see what we find out. Whereas you saw the feet, Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom, this last kingdom, shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic, and I believe the King James says miry, right? It's just a sticky kind of potter's clay, shall be mixed with ceramic clay. Now, I want you to be reminded of something. So I'm going to take you to a kind of a parallel verse in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. Friends, you and I do not have a license to just assign what we think prophecy should be. Is that fair? You and I can't just say, well, I think it means this. Well, no, you're wrong. I think it means this. We need to let the Bible interpret itself, and then we need to compare what the Bible has given us to the historical record and find out what happened. Because what God did did not happen over here in a vacuum. What God did happened in the stream of time right with the history of men. Notice what Peter said. Know this first, or we should be knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any what? Friends, you and I do not have a license to just come up with whatever we want. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So friends, we want to stay faithful to what the Bible is teaching us. And we can recognize very clearly Daniel 2.38 when he says, You are this head of gold, we know which kingdom is being referenced. And it is the kingdom of Babylon. Babylon was teeming with gold. It was one of the most wealthy, magnificent empires ever to be established on this earth. It was incredible the amount of gold that existed in Babylon. In fact... It was actually something that they used to pave part of their streets. It's crazy. The throne, the temple, uh, where the altar, rather, I said temple, forgive me. The throne and altar in Nebuchadnezzar's throne room. Wait till you hear how big it was. But Aeschylus, he was an ancient Greek poet. As he studied the record books, he said that Babylon was teeming with gold. Herodotus, he also was a Greek historian he says that there was great lavishness of gold in the sanctuary of Bel Marduk. That altar to Bel Marduk, and this was their primary god, Bel Marduk and Nebuchadnezzar's throne was estimated to have weighed eight and a half tons of pure gold. A ton is 2,000 pounds. Eight times 16. It's not calculus. Somebody help me out. No? I messed up. Eight times two is how much? Sixteen. What's a half a ton? So sixteen plus one, seventeen thousand pounds of gold. Can you imagine? This is just Nebuchadnezzar's throne and the altar where they laid sacrifice to Bel Marduk. Obviously, history speaks very clearly that Babylon was the kingdom of gold. Babylon was also known for its one of the seven wonders of the world, the hanging gardens of Babylon, and how they built these cement aqueducts to keep the gardens alive, and they were elevated. 
course, the Tigris River ran right through there. Um, notice this. Archaeologists, archaeologists rather, of course, have done excavations on the ruins of Babylon. And one of the things they have found are these cuneiform tablets. And cuneiform, of course, is a kind of a, a glyph-type writing where these different symbols mean things, and they've unlocked this. Notice what was found in one of these cuneiform tablets. It says, the fortifications of Babylon, I strengthened and established the name of my reign for how long? Did Nebuchadnezzar, was he told that his kingdom would last forever? You're the head of gold, but what's coming next? A second kingdom that's better or inferior to yours? Notice at first, he did not want to believe God. So he kept trying to fortify Babylon to make it stronger and stronger. In fact, it is, it is told through historians that Babylon was so well fortified and they had such food stores that an army would have to come to Babylon and lay siege to them for 20 years to starve them out. Can you imagine? So these guys thought that they were impenetrable. They thought they were untouchable. Babylon thought it was the Titanic of the ancient world. Notice what else he says in these cuneiform tablets. The whole earth is prostrate at Babylon's feet. You're all bowing beneath me. Babylon, the city which is the delight of my eyes, which I have glorified, may it last forever. But history tells us very clearly that Babylon did not last forever. He came into power around 605 B.C., but Babylon was overthrown in the year 539 B.C. So Daniel reminds him, right, you're the head of gold, but another kingdom is coming, and he says it will be inferior to yours. So what kingdom came along afterwards? Well, the chest and arms of silver very clearly represent the kingdom that overthrew Babylon. In 539, they were overthrown by the Medo-Persians. Now, you may recall from our study last week of Daniel chapter 7, do you remember the bear? I told you that there was a bear that represented Medo-Persia. Do you remember that the bear was raised up on one side? Right? And we talked about how that was a strength. Well, in this dual empire, the Persians were the stronger of the two empires. So Medo-Persia is representing this chest and arms of silver. But how did it happen? This is an amazing story. October 13th, 539 B.C., Babylon is quiet on the outside, but on the inside, there's all kind of partying and carrying on happening because they didn't think that they could be overthrown. Well-fortified, high walls, thick walls. You can't, you can't starve us out, but there they are. You can read about this in Daniel chapter 5, that they're there and the king... Belteshazzar, he was drinking out of the temple vessels, the cups that were supposed to take the blood from sacrifice for God and be brought in and poured at the altar of God. They were using them to drink alcohol and all their partying. Well, there was a general, a general by the name of Cyrus. Cyrus comes. Nobody's guarding the walls. Even the guards are drunk. And Cyrus has his men dig a, a channel, and he digs a channel, and I told you the Tigris earlier, I misspoke, it's the Euphrates, forgive me, but the Euphrates ran right through the city of Babylon. They dammed up the river, dug a channel, and diverted the river out into the desert. And that gate that was in the city wall, they were able to walk in the city right under the river gate. They overthrew Babylon that night, and not a single shot, so to speak, was fired. Everybody was partying. The guards were all inebriated as well. And in 539, Babylon met their demise just as God predicted that they would. Here's what's incredible. God predicted even the general, the general who would overthrow this city, he called him by name, and it was 180 years before he was born. Notice what God said in Isaiah 45 verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to whom? Cyrus. To Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. What are the double doors? Again, if you go back and look at the history, the ruins of Babylon, the Ishtar gates 
where I showed you those golden lions the other night, last week, the Ishtar gates were double doors. God predicted 180 years in advance. Does God know what's happening? Do you think we can trust the word of God? Wow, what an amazing story. And it unfolded. But for years, for years, for, for centuries, people said, you know what? The Bible's a liar. There's nothing in the historical record that verifies the biblical account. I'm going to tell you, I thank God for biblical archaeologists. Because as there were ex excavations happening, this cylinder was found. And this is another cuneiform cylinder. And this, was called, this is called the Cyrus Cylinder, as you can see. And this is actually on display in the British Museum. And as archaeologists have uncoded, as they have translated the Cyrus Cylinder, they find that the biblical account of Cyrus and the Medo-Persian army overthrowing Babylon is recorded on the Cyrus Cylinder exactly as the Bible portrayed. Wow. Finally, the critics have been silenced. The evidence is there. And it may seem for a season, well, there's nothing in history, so we can't verify the Bible. Friends, let me tell you this. The Bible does not need archaeology to make it true. But I'm so thankful when we have those finds that take away people's arguments, aren't you? It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. There's others I could talk to you about, but let's keep looking. We don't want to run out of time. Daniel 2.39 Another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth, was going to come onto the scene. That's exactly what happened. In 168 B.C., notice these are, these are long ruling periods, right? They were in control of vast places of the earth for many, many, many years. But Greece comes on the scene. And you may recall from Daniel chapter 7 that the nation of Greece was depicted by what animal? Leopards, fast or slow. Very fast, and if you, want to, if you want to soup up your leopard, if you want to make your leopard faster, what do you put on him? Wings. Remember Daniel chapter 7, this, this leopard had wings, and it had how many heads? Four heads, and you remember we talked about those are the four generals that came to power after Alexander died, but Alexander the Great did come into power very, very quickly. In the short period of seven years, Greece became the ruling world empire. Alexander the Great, of course, is the one who led the charge in that rapid ascent to power by Greece. Unfortunately, he died way too early in his mid-30s. And historians speculate it was due to um, licentious living, we might say. He, he's believed to have died of alcohol poisoning. How sad. You've got everything the world has to offer, and you throw your life away with alcohol. Aren't you glad nobody does that today? Well, wait a minute. Nothing new under the sun, is there? And friends, that's the point. All these principles that we see from the lessons of history, they're not just fun historical facts. That's why I'm telling you over and over, this is about walking with Jesus. This is about choosing to be a disciple of Christ because the same thing that took down Alexander could be the same thing that takes down your family. And how many families have been wrecked and torn apart because of drugs and alcohol? Still happening today, just like it has happened over the courses of history. But we know that God's word is true. So what about this fourth kingdom? This iron kingdom that smashes and shatters and breaks everything into pieces? Well, Rome is the empire that is known as the iron monarchy of Rome. Okay, and, and as I had said to you, speaking of the crucifixion last week, we talked to you about how the Romans would take tactics of other nations and they would improve upon them. So when the Romans came to face the Grecian army, they not only had weapons that were now iron weapons, the, the Greeks, they had an advantage because they had a new armor that was made out of bronze, but bronze doesn't hold up very well compared, compared to iron. And so when they faced the iron armies, if you will, of Rome, they were no match for them. And of course, the Romans became the ruling world power. But the influence of Greek culture was still pervasive. Uh, how, how many of you have ever heard of Hellenistic culture? Okay, Hellenistic culture refers to Helena, the mother of Alexander the Great, and her influence of art and language. And so even during the time of Jesus, the predominant language was not Hebrew. By this time, Hebrew was the temple text. It was the temple language. Aramaic 
was spoken in, in many corners of Judaism. But Koine Greek, K-O-I-N-E, Koine, or common Greek, was the common language that was spoken during the time of Jesus. But we know what, to, what soldiers nailed Jesus to the cross? Roman soldiers. What soldiers put Jesus in a tomb? Roman soldiers. What governor relented to the, the shouting crowd and condemned Jesus to die? Roman governor, right? Pontius Pilate. We know that these leaders are the ones who were the world power during the time of Jesus. So notice how we're marching down through the time, right? We're seeing history unfold. We see that it's verified. And God wants us to have these historical markers. I gave you this last week. If you want to make a little note and write it down, I'll tell it to you again. But in Luke chapter 3, verse 1, it says, In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, that John was at the Jordan River baptizing, and you go down to about verse 21. I'm shooting from the lip, but I think it's verse 21. It says that Jesus also came and was baptized. So we know, bless you, we know when Jesus was baptized. Because we can go and look and see what was the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, and it was 27 AD. Right? So we're marching down through the scope of time, and the Bible is tracking with it right on time. Daniel 2.41, what happens to this fourth kingdom? Each of the preceding kingdoms were overthrown by another major ruling power. That's not what happens with Rome. He says, whereas you saw the feet and toes, question, pop quiz, anatomy and physiology, how many toes do the average two feet have? I said, average two feet. Give me the total. Right? I don't want to hear about your weird genetic trail in your family. If you've got 14, I don't want to know about it. I certainly don't want to see pictures. I'm messing with you. But the average foot has five toes, two feet. Very simple math gives us ten toes. We have seen that these numbers are significant. Remember last week we looked in Daniel chapter 7, and there, there were horns who came up on the beast that had iron teeth. Do you remember how many horns came up on that, that fourth beast? It was ten horns. Notice the parallel now. We had ten horns in Daniel 7. In Daniel 2, we have ten toes. And it's going to be a divided kingdom. And parts of the kingdom are going to be strong, and other parts of the kingdom are going to be weak. You remember when the little horn power came up? That it was different, and when it came up, it plucked some other horns out by the roots. Do you remember how many it was? Three horns. Right? So we see that these are kingdoms, and God is using different symbols to try to communicate what's happening. But notice, this is not a kingdom that will be united. The Bible says that it's a kingdom that shall be what? Divided. And so we see those divisions of the ten toes. And when you look to history, that's exactly what happened. As corruption and all of these things began to creep into especially the western part of the Roman Empire... We saw that these so-called, history calls them barbaric tribes, these barbarian tribes began to rebel, and they began to try to overthrow the Roman power. It was so strong that Constantine, I shared this with you last week, it bears repeating this week, Constantine fled to what is now modern-day Turkey. He went to Istanbul, but he called it Constantinople. Again, somebody else who's very proud of themselves. Let's name the city after me. Besides, I'm so great and I'm taking care of you. Wouldn't you want your city named after me? A lot of arrogance in these rulers. But history shows very clearly that when the fall of the Roman Empire happened, those ten toes represented the kingdoms. And of course, apart from the three that were destroyed, those kingdoms make up modern-day Europe. Friends, guess what? You and I are living in the toes. We're living in the toes of this statue. That's the time frame prophetically where we find ourselves. But have there been attempts to unify Europe? Have, have people tried to conquer all of Europe? Yeah. What attempt to unify the nations does this prophecy mention? Well, it says that they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere one to another. It's a divided kingdom, and it will remain divided despite the efforts of Napoleon. Napoleon was on fire. French general who rose to power, became emperor, basically declared himself emperor, and he was 
wiping across Europe. He was overthrowing these other nations. And in the middle of summer, go and check this out for yourself. In the middle of summer, there was a freak snowstorm that happened that caused Napoleon to lose the battle. And Napoleon is actually quoted as saying, it's as if the hand of God himself were against me. Napoleon was not a God-fearing man, but he recognized this is weird. Militarily, on paper, this was an easy win. I should have had this. Something bigger was working against me. A freak snowstorm in the middle of summer. And of course, Napoleon, his body, his tomb, lies as a silent witness to the faithfulness of God's word. And he wasn't the only one. Another Frenchman, Charlemagne, tried to unite Europe. He was defeated. Charles V tried to unite all of Europe, defeated. How much success are you going to have going against a prophecy of God? It's not going to happen. It didn't happen for Louis XIV. Notice all these Frenchmen. They got big ideas on taking over Europe, right? Napoleon, of course, we've already discussed. A German comes to the power, Kaiser Wilhelm. He was defeated. And of course, in our most recent history, of course, Adolf Hitler. I praise God that each of these people failed. Not because I want to see people fail, because I believe that my God tells the truth. How about you? And his prophecy has proven to be true. When God says something will come to pass, friends, you can count on the fact that it's going to happen. So now every time you see this this banner, who's the head of gold? Oh, mercy, you can't fail your first pop quiz. Babylon's the head of gold. That chest of silver, who are you going to think of? Meat of Persia. That belly and thighs of bronze, who came next? Greece, and then of course, who were the iron legs? Rome, and then that divided, mixed up, partly strong, partly weak kingdoms. Those ten kingdoms were what? Basically the remnants of ancient and now modern Europe. You see the yellow arrow on the screen? What do you think that yellow arrow represents? Strength? No. Think of this statue. This statue is a timeline, right? Where does that arrow represent in the timeline, would you guess? Huh? No. Jesus Jesus was under the iron monarchy of Rome. So we'd have to be down in the legs somewhere for Jesus. Huh? Huh? Okay, what about Daniel? He was around about that time. That is the approximate place on the timeline where Daniel would have died. How much did Daniel see fulfilled of his prophecy? Only a piece of it. But he saw enough. He trusted God. He knew that God was faithful. But that's why I say to people, you know more about the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy than he did. How cool is that? Because Daniel was looking forward. You and I have the blessing of looking back to see that God was 100% accurate. He was 100% faithful to his word. But what about that last piece? Right? Said something about a stone that was coming. Well, God alone knows the future. And I want to say this to you. If Jesus controls the rise and fall of world empires, can you trust him to guide the direction of your life? What do you think? And I don't want you to think, well, listen, God's busy with big stuff. How many of you remember the story I told you about my trailer keys that I left on the bumper of my vehicle? Does God remember, does he care about the little stuff? And I'm going to be honest with you. My life, in the grand scheme of earth's history, my life is a little something. But even my little life, your little life, is important to Jesus. He cares about your life. He cares about my life. We may feel insignificant in the grand scheme of things, but we're not insignificant to God. So that next event that happens in the days of these kings, what time period is this earth's timeline in? Well, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Yes, those kingdoms exist today, but there's coming a time when they will be wiped away. But how will God set up his kingdom that will cause the earthly kingdoms to crumble? Well, it says that that rock would be cut out without hands. 
But who is the stone that will set up God's eternal kingdom? I love what Paul says. Who's the rock, friends? Christ. Christ is the rock. He is the one that will come and establish his kingdom. And it will be a kingdom that eradicates the kingdoms of men. And it will be a kingdom that lasts forever. I want to be a part of that kingdom. How about you? And at the very end of it, after Nebuchadnezzar is at the end of, sitting on the edge of his throne, he says to Nebuchadnezzar, the dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Question for you. Do you believe that the interpretation is sure? Do you believe that God is faithful? Do you believe that as Jesus went to the cross, he had you on his heart? That he had you in his mind? And as he stretched out his arms, held to the cross with iron spikes, the Roman Empire, Jesus knew that one day soon he would come again in the clouds of glory and that he would bring us home. And so this morning, Jesus is here by the power of his spirit. And he's gently knocking on your heart's door. Is there something in you that you're holding back? Or have you given everything to Christ? I want to encourage you today. Open the door. And if there's a part of you that you've been holding back, give it to Jesus. Let him have everything. Obviously, he can be trusted with the big things. So I guarantee you he can be trusted with the little things. What do you say? He can be trusted with our salvation. Imagine you're part of a family. This is actually a picture of a family with 20 kids. And I'm just going to tell you, shoot me. (laughs) My wife and I had two boys and a girl our girl in the middle, and they're about 16 and 17 months apart. And that was a great idea until they became teenagers at the same time. And we were outnumbered. (laughs) But I tell you, I love my kids. I I can't think of life without having one of my kids. They're all three precious to me. I don't want to lose my children. Imagine that family of 20 losing even one, do you think they're going to feel the loss? I believe they will. What about God? How many more children does he have? Do you think he's going to feel the loss if you're not there? I believe he will. I believe it brings sadness to the heart of God to think that he doesn't have to prepare a place for me or you or whoever may not choose to follow him. They're coming a day, friends, and I believe it's a day that's coming very, very soon. Do I know how soon? No, and I'm not an alarmist. I'm not going to try to get you stirred up because, well, you think Jesus is coming soon. I better get ready. Listen, I may fall over dead tomorrow. Is that possible? I'm 49 years old. I don't know that I have any underlying health conditions other than I've got too much stuffing but I regularly see on the Facebook page for my high school graduating class and over a third of my classmates that I graduated with in 92 are already dead. I don't know how much time I have left, so I want to be ready today. So even if I go to the grave, the next thing that I see will be my Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. I want to be there to meet him. I want to be able to spend eternity with him. How about you? Is that your desire today? Let me pray with you, please. Loving Father, wow. Lord, thank you for this.